<laughs> Lovely to see you all today. Welcome to Longmeadow Evangelical Church. My name is Ben Epps, part of the leadership team here. It's a, a special day today, Remembrance Day. We remember those who gave their lives to secure our freedom. Millions of soldiers and civilians died fighting wicked regimes, particularly in World Wars I and II. Their courage secured our national peace, and we too easily take it for granted. So later in the service, just before 11, after the children have gone out, we're going to pause for two minutes of silent prayer. We'll give thanks for the sacrifice of many, give thanks for the security that we enjoy, and we'll also pray for various places where war continues. But first, let's find our refuge in God. We can find total security in him today. For our confidence isn't in governments or in military might, it's in him. And that's what uh, Psalm 46 really is all about. We're going to uh, declare this um, responsibly, so I'll read the bits in yellow if we'll join together with the bits in white. It's for the director of music of the Sons of Korah, according to Alamot, it's a song. Together. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he's brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still. Another way of saying that is weapons down. And know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Well, let's join together with a hymn based on those very words. God is our strength and refuge. standing. Let's pray with the words that Jesus taught his own disciples, the Lord's Prayer, together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Jesus is so realistic that we'll face temptations within, and there will be evil in the world around us. What should we do? We should turn to Jesus our Lord. If you're able to remain standing, we're going to sing, Hear Me, Lord. So we continue in open prayer to the one who hears and loves us. Faithful Lord, we call upon you this morning as we wake up. We thank you for you are a Lord of mercy. In your faithfulness, Lord, remember us. Remember us when we feel weary, when we feel tired, when we can't even say anything to you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the words you are the one who says. And Father, we thank you that you saved by the sending of your son Jesus. You die on the cross for us and take our punishment. We thank you that he is not only our Saviour, but he is our King and King. And Father, we look forward to that day when we will see him face to face. Father God, we've just been reminded by grace of your mercy and your grace. And we pray to you, Father, that that grace is vouching within our people. You brought us through to yourself. 
the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. And we bring our praise and thanks to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> and Father, we pray that you would bring salvation to the lost. May all our friends and family see Christ as Lord and receive him as their only Saviour. And good shepherd on high, please grant repentance and guidance to those who are wayward. We all wander at times, but we thank you for the warm welcome to all those who come home. While we pray that all the prodigals we know would return soon. And Holy Spirit, please comfort those who suffer today. Bring justice and peace to homes where there is conflict. And enable each of us to apologise and put things right where we can. Help us to reach out in compassion to our aching society, and especially to each other. And as you bring relief to those in mental anguish, and heal those who are sick, and as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus, make us channels of your gospel mercy and everlasting comfort. Amen. Amen. We're going to continue committing ourselves and our world into the hands of this faithful God, though the nations rage. seats as we continue in prayer. Let's bow our heads. Ancient of days, we thank you that all of time and all of the world is in your hands. 
And so we pray for kings and presidents and MPs to bow to your authority. May those leaders gathered at COP29 this next two days further reduce carbon emissions so that your creation won't be further damaged by human greed and pride. And may Donald Trump submit to Christ as he claims to. May he repent of his sins and may he stand for peace and justice, trusting in your mercy and compassion. And please cause our King Charles and Queen Camilla not only to rely on you through all the ups and downs of physical health, but may they defend the faith, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may Justin Welby and the other leaders of the Church of England correctly define the gospel and put all their trust in the word of Christ our Saviour. May Keir Starmer and our government uphold justice and not selfish independence in our nation. May they see through simplistic new policies and reinforce laws that protect both equity and compassion. May Kemi Badenoch stand against evil as the leader of the opposition. May she see you as the source of all the good that she holds dear. And particularly we pray that the proposal to legalise assisted suicide in our nation may be rejected so that the innocent would be defended, so that no one would ever feel that our society thinks them unfit to live. May we instead continue to lead the way in effective care for all who suffer. And Lord, we pray that the good news of a saviour full of mercy, full of kindness to the weak and the strong, to the, the great and the small, would be on our lips. Give us courage today and the rest of this week and always to make the most of every opportunity. That he would be exalted in our nation and beyond. Amen. Amen. Well, there's lots coming up uh, that give opportunities for the Lord Jesus to be exalted. Do come along tonight. Uh, we've got the third in our series about reaching out, and we'll be thinking about reaching out to Mormons. And if you come across those uh, folks knocking on your door, usually two young people, smartly dressed, smiling, but sadly following a gospel that is no gospel at all. They believe that you have to be perfectly obedient in order for God to show you mercy. And that's not what the Bible teaches. God shows mercy even on the wicked who repent. It's a beautiful message that we've got to share with even those folks that come to our door. Um, we've also <clears throat> got these opportunities coming up uh, to share a free lunch uh, with those in our community. Um, the next community lunch is on Tuesday the 19th. Uh, do invite folks, um, it's a great uh, opportunity, but do book. Uh, it's very helpful if we know how many that we're expecting so that we can have enough food. Our next uh, ball games and pizza event, well, this is even more fun and even more food. Goodness, what a great week it is, that one. Uh, so that's Saturday the 23rd, um, two weeks' time. Drop in between 4 o'clock and 9 o'clock. You don't have to stay for the whole time, but if you want some pizza, you need to be there about 6 o'clock. Uh, or even a little bit earlier, so that we've got a good idea of uh, the amount that needs to be ordered. The, I, I think the guideline is, please arrive by half five in order to place your order and make a suggested donation of £3.50 per, um, per person. Uh, two other things coming up. Um, at the end of the month, uh, to help Natalie put her house uh, on the market, uh, we're going to uh, have a, a working party uh, to do various jobs like cleaning and gardening. Uh, if you're able to help with that, any time between 11 and 5, don't, don't, again, you don't have to stay for the whole time. Goodness, you'd be exhausted. Um, but do um, let Natalie know. Um, she'd love as much help as possible. Um, and finally, uh, there's a Christmas, the Christmas journey is being uh, run. Uh, do let uh, Gemma know if you're, is Gemma here today? Oh, she's doing Sunday school. Okay, fine. Uh, find her after the service um, and thank her for looking after the children there. But also do let her know if you're able to help uh, and volunteer uh, for the Christmas journey, which is coming up uh, in December. Lots of uh, local children uh, will be hearing about the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth to be our saviour. Um, it's a wonderful thing to be involved in. Oh yes, I mustn't forget. Today, oh, have got these Advent devotionals out. Every year we celebrate uh, Advent. We look forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus. And uh, we like to give out free books. If you, if you want to make a donation of a pound per book, you, you, that would be very welcome, but they're free. Um, 
and you'll find one per household on the table there. Please don't take more than that because uh, we've got a limited number. There's also a few other books available um, that you can also peruse and take away. Maybe you're looking for a Christmas present for a friend. Uh, there's books there to help with a whole range of issues in life and to inspire us. But this book, Sin in Exaltation, ha helps us through the month of December to think about one carol at a time. And it just takes a little paragraph of some of the what beautiful words that we're going to be singing and helps us think more deeply about the Lord Jesus. So if you're not currently working your way through a Christian book, I encourage you to pick up one of these really short chapters and just a little bit to enjoy each day as you look forward to Christmas. <coughs> oh, yes. In the foyer, there's information, I didn't bring it with me, there's information about a book fair on the 23rd of November at Wellin Evangelical Church. I think that's earlier in the day from the um, board games and pizza night. Um, so if you really want to uh, go big on shopping for Christian books, um, I encourage you to go down to Wellin Evangelical Church during that day, 23rd of November. You'll find flyers about that in the foyer. Right. <coughs> Children. I hope you are ready for a song with actions. I certainly am. We haven't sung this one in a while. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And the mountains are his, like that, isn't it? The rivers are his, and the stars are his handiwork too. That's what we're looking forward to singing, because our God we can trust, because he's in charge of everything. So let's stand, let's sing, and if you're able, join in with the actions. pray. Father, we thank you that you are capable of doing anything. You made us, you made this world around us, and we pray you teach us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, time now, you may have guessed, for the children to enjoy going out to their different groups. And do say uh, good morning to those around you as they do so, if you haven't already. Okay. This uh, statue on the screen is of a blacksmith, and it's titled, Let Us Beat Swords into Plowshares. And it stands outside the United Nations headquarters in New York. And it's inspired by these verses in the Bible, Isaiah 2, looking forward to the time when God will finally bring peace on earth. The Lord will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation won't take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. We're about to pause in prayer 
to give thanks for those who stood for that vision, who sought to bring peace. And we'll also pray for regions in the world still marked by warfare. You might think of the Middle East or Yemen, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Ukraine. Ironically, that statue was gifted to the UN in 1959 by the Soviet Union. It's proof that diplomacy is still not quite enough to restrain human greed and violence. We need to pray that the Lord Jesus Christ disarms the dictators and subdues the violence, and that warring factions will come together humbly around his cross. It's only in Christ that the world will find lasting peace. So, we're going to spend two minutes in silence. After the first minute of prayer for the nations, I'll give us another minute to give thanks for the self-sacrifice of those who went before us, as well as chiefly for our Saviour. Let's bow our heads. Jesus said, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for your great love that redeems us from condemnation, that we may enjoy eternal life for free. But we thank you also for those who followed in your footsteps, giving their lives that we might enjoy peace in this world. We pray for them who continue to risk their lives today. For soldiers, for medical staff, and even for civilians. Lord, be their refuge and strength. Be their present help in every trouble. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to prepare to listen to the words of our great Saviour now as we stand to sing confidently. You're the Word of God the Father. He's the one who's been around since the world began. Though it is a broken world, His cry of love is going out across the land. And that is where we place our hope. Let's stand and sing. You're the Word of God the Father.
Father, we thank you for this cry of love that the Lord Jesus has rung out across our world. Thank you for opening our hearts to hear and to respond. And Lord, we pray that you would do so once again as we uh, look to your word. Give us uh, hearts and minds that are ready to respond to the love that you have lavished on us in the Lord Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Do you please take a seat? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, if you've ever watched the, um, the Antiques Roadshow, there's every chance you've done so for one main reason. That astonishing moment when someone realises that that nice painting that great aunt Muriel left them, which they've hung on to because it's, it's all right, and everyone loved great aunt Muriel, and so it hangs in the downstairs loo where you can see it every day. That painting then turns out to be an early Monet, and life is suddenly turned upside down for this particular family. All of a sudden, this, um, this painting which the family would, would look at from time to time and which made them smile with affection for great aunt Muriel, suddenly is the thing that will utterly transform their lives. It will pay for their house and their car and their children's education and get them uh, their children started on the housing market. It is the same as it ever was. But suddenly it's not consigned to the wall of the downstairs loo anymore because they've taken a deeper look at it and they see what it really is. See, understanding what you've got is utterly transformative. Understanding what you've got is utterly transformative. Last week, the author to the Hebrews broke off from talking about Jesus, our great high priest, to to warn his readers about the dangers of coasting in their walk with the Lord. Well, now he returns to that subject. The likelihood is that uh, his first readers were Christians from a a Jewish background, so they, they knew the importance of talking about Jesus being described as their great high priest. But our author wants them to go deeper than that. He wants them, and therefore us, to understand more of the fullness of what they have in Christ. He doesn't want them just to coast along with a a superficial understanding or, or experience of what Jesus has done for them. He wants them to know and to enjoy the wonder of what it means that Jesus is our great high priest, who opens the way to the Father. He wants them, he wants us, to see what we have in Jesus. So let's listen to the opening verses of our passage today. We're on page 1205 in the Church Bibles. I'm going to read from chapter 6 and verse 12, which is the last verse of our passage from last week, so you can hear the way in which it ties in with what we were seeing then. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. When God made his promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. People swear by someone greater than themselves, and the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. Because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose very clear, to the heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hope of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf, He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So our author here is is working back to the point that he reached in chapter 5 and verse 10 when he first introduced the idea of this high priestly order of Melchizedek. You can see he gets there in verse 20 of our passage. Now we took a brief look at a couple of these verses last week as we heard about the the reassurances that our writer was giving after his warning. Reassurances about the the certainty of God's promises. But actually, if you look a little bit closer, it's not just about the promises of God that he's reminding them. He also talks about the oath of God. 
God swears that he will keep his promises. If you like, he's, he's doubling down on his commitment to them. See, the taking of an oath in the ancient world was a serious thing. It was the, it was the ultimate commitment to a cause. It basically, it called down consequences on you if you didn't keep your word. And so therefore, an oath was always sworn by something greater than yourself. So um, it might be, uh, so uh, it, it could be uh, by a king who could then mete out consequences if the, uh, the swearer failed to do what they wanted. Or people would swear ultimately by God himself, inviting his judgment if they didn't follow through and do what they'd said. Well, as our writer points out, for God, of course, there is nothing greater than himself, is there? And so we're told that still he swears, but he swears by his own name. He is that committed to the word he has given. That word that was first given to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and reaffirmed many times after that, a promise of a people and a place and a blessing to all nations. That word that was ultimately fulfilled in Jesus, which is where we end up to end up at in verse 20, isn't it? But before we go any further into chapter 7, where we'll spend most of our time, um, I just want us to notice the heart of this promise that God has made. What was this great blessing that he said that he would bring? I wonder what ideas come to mind if you think about the great blessing of the gospel. Perhaps words like forgiveness are prominent. That's what the gospel promises are all about, aren't they? The gospel promises the forgiveness of our sin. Well, at the risk of sounding irreverent, that's a bit like hanging a money in your downstairs loo. See, what God promises in the gospel is himself. What God promises in the gospel is himself. It is entry into his presence. It is to be with him. It is to enjoy him. It is to delight in him. Now, forgiveness is, is necessary, yes, because without it, we can do no such thing. We cannot approach God. We can't approach a holy God while our sin remains. But forgiveness actually is a means to an end. And that end is to be with God. I wonder if you spotted a significant word as our writer takes us back to this subject of Jesus, our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. It's there in verse 20. Now the high priest, of course, was the only one, the one person who could enter the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, the inner sanctuary, the place where God dwelt. Once a year he could do that. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, he could do so to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Well, we're told here that Jesus, that is where Jesus has gone as our great high priest. But there's one more detail there, isn't there, if you notice it? Jesus has gone there as our forerunner. Which means that one day we will follow him because of what he has done for us. And so already, do you see, this great high priest, this Lord Jesus, is unlike any high priest who has ever gone before. Never has there been any suggestion of others entering the very presence of God, like the high priest did. High priests were, were representatives, were, were mediators, but they were never forerunners. Jesus is doing something completely new here and completely wonderful. He is offering us entrance into the inner sanctuary, into the very presence of God himself. So do you see this great high priest in the order of Melchizedek is of a totally different order. He is utterly unlike any high priest who has ever gone before. In the verses that follow, our, our author is going to show us what we have in this great high priest and just how different he is. Chapter 7, verse 1 to 10. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. 
without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they also are descended from Abraham. This man, however, Melchizedek, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, the Levitical priests, but in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth today, paid the tenth through Abraham. Because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestors. We'll unpack some of that as we go along. But if you're any fan of TV murder mysteries, maybe you watch one of those after the Antiques Roadshow, you'll know one simple rule whenever you watch a TV murder mystery. You always look out for the character who appears quite early on, but is quickly forgotten. An incident or a comment that is left hanging without any real explanation, but which seems to be moved on past by the detectives or whoever it is. Those are always the things, spoiler alert for every TV mystery you watch in the future, those are always the things that with a little bit of a closer examination are going to be, turn out to be key for whatever turns out and who done it. It's no accident or irrelevance that the writer has included them. The character of Melchizedek plays not a not dissimilar role in the Bible. Blink and you'd miss him. He gets a mere three verses in Genesis chapter 14 in a seemingly random and irrelevant encounter with Abraham. This is what happens. After Abraham returned from defeating Kedalemor and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. That's it. That's the whole story. Until his name pops up again in Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is a psalm all about the Messiah. But again, it's just one verse, which our writer has already quoted in uh, chapter 5 and verse 6, and he's about to do so again in chapter 7 and verses 17 and verse 21. Uh, psalm 110 goes like this. The Lord says to my Lord... Sit at my hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on, the day, on your day of battle. Arrayed in holy splendor, your young men will come to you, like dew from the morning womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change in his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that really is it. Those are the only mentions that we have about him. We know nothing more about Melchizedek at all. But actually, we don't need to. Because the historical person of Melchizedek is actually not really a very big deal for the author of Hebrews here. When, uh, when he writes, when he quotes a third time from Psalm 110 in chapter 7 and verse 21, this time when he quotes it, he, he leaves off Melchizedek's name entirely. And he doesn't mention it again in the rest of the chapter. See, we're not supposed to get sidetracked into trying to work out exactly who this bloke Melchizedek was, the historical person of Melchizedek. Instead, we're supposed to learn and see how the Bible uses this mysterious figure and this strange encounter to point towards the true high priest who was one day to come, the greater high priest, the Lord Jesus. That's where the writer of the Hebrews goes in these verses. He wants to help us to see how Jesus' priesthood, this priesthood of Melchizedek, is so much superior to the priesthood of Levi, which is laid out in the Old Testament law. 
Let me show you a few little ways in which it is uh, bigger and better. Firstly, Melchizedek was both priest and king. Now those rules were kept, those roles were kept strictly separate under the law, but the order of Melchizedek combines the two. This is new and different. Secondly, we're told that his name and his city speak of righteousness and peace. Now, names meant a great deal in the ancient world. They conveyed something of character of the individual, not not simply a label to address them by, like we do today often. So this priest embodies, he represents righteousness and peace. Peace meaning not simply calm, but wholeness and completeness. Thirdly, and most intriguingly perhaps, this priest has no beginning or end. Without, uh, without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, says the author to the Hebrews. Now, our writer is not suggesting um, that the man Melchizedek in the Old Testament was literally eternal. That's not what he's saying. But in a time when genealogy and family lines were so significant, the fact that Melchizedek, the man who blesses Abraham, is given none, is remarkable. If you read through the book of Genesis, you see the number of times that genealogies and family lines crop up, lists of families are given. It's striking that the author of Genesis gives no such details for Melchizedek. He's a blank slate. It is, we might say, as if he had no father or mother, no beginning or end, because none is recorded for him. He appears in the narrative and he goes away again. And that is that. And now both uh, Psalm 110 and now our writer to the Hebrews make much of the the symbolic significance of that absence of father or mother, birth or death. This mysterious figure of Melchizedek with no beginning or end becomes a shadow of the greater priest to come. One whose service as a priest will never end because he will never die. And then fourthly, we're told that Great as Abraham was, he honoured Melchizedek, giving him a tenth of the plunder that he just won in war. He honoured Melchizedek, and Melchizedek in turn blessed him. So our writer sees a clear hierarchy being established here. The, The priest was treated as greater by Abraham, the great patriarch of our faith, and this priest blessed Abraham. More than that, he goes on to add in verses 9 uh, and 10. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. See, Levi was one of the sons of Jacob, and his priest became the priestly order of the Old Covenant. All priests were in the tribe of Levi. But The writer says here, as as one not yet born at this point in history, symbolically he was still in his um, father Abraham's body. He was then almost part of paying the tithe, this tribute to Melchizedek. And so therefore uh, acknowledging his superiority. Now you might notice our writer admits that he's stretching the point slightly here. One, One might say, he says, But actually, his point is important for two reasons. Firstly, because he establishes that Jesus, as the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek, is actually of a superior order of priesthood to any priest there's ever been in in Israel. This is bigger and better. And secondly, he's saying, actually, this priesthood, this priesthood came first. See, Jesus as the great high priest is not plan B from God when plan A didn't work. No, rather the Levitical priesthood was only ever a stopgap. It was only ever a, a teaching tool pointing to a greater priesthood that was still to come. So the priesthood of Melchizedek is not simply high priest 2.0. It's a whole new ball game, says our writer. It's a whole new ball game, and it's that, uh, it's that idea which our author then teases out in the verses that follow, in verses 11 onwards. 
Verse 11, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, well then why was there still need for another priest to come? One in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these things are said, uh, in Jesus, belong to a different tribe. And no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord Jesus descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of regulation as to his ancestry, in other words being part of the tribe of Levi, but rather on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation, the Old Testament law, is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced, by which we draw near to God. And it is not without an oath. Others became priests without any oath, but he became a priest with an oath when, the Lord, when God said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Let's see if we can follow his argument here. So to begin with, he says in verse 11, the Levitical priesthood established by the, by the old covenant was never intended to be the final word on the subject. It never promised perfection, verse 11. After all, he says, if it had been the final word, what would have been the point of Psalm 110? And the promises of this other priest, this Messiah, who would be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he says this is, again, not simply a better priest, a priest 2.0, an improved version on the ones that have come before, kind of like Aaron and his descendants, but a kind of souped-up version. No, he says this is an entirely new thing that's begun. And so because it's an entirely new thing, not mandated by Old Testament law, that means that therefore that law itself has been superseded, has been put to one side. Because that law insisted that priests could only, but only, come from the tribe of Levi. Jesus came from the tribe of Judah the tribe of the kings. So verse 12, when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. This is something new, says our author. This is a new covenant. What's more, Jesus is not the first in a new line of priests who will follow after. He, we're told, is the only priest because he remains priest forever because he has conquered death. Verse 16, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. He has conquered death for us. And so what? Well, so the result, therefore, is that Jesus, this new priest, brings a better hope. Verse 19. And what lies at the heart of this better hope? It's what we talked about at the beginning, the great promise of the gospel. The great heart of this better hope is that by this hope, we draw near to God. Remember what we saw back in chapter 6 and verse 20? Jesus is our forerunner who goes into the presence of God. Now we too are drawn into the very presence of God. See, Old Testament priests could, could, only, could never, only enter the sanctuary once a year to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. And then they had to come out again for their own safety and protection. Once a year, and then only the priest. And the people stayed outside. So the presence of God actually remained cut off, and Old Testament priests could do nothing about it. They were limited by their own sin. Yes, it was wonderful that God dwelt amongst his people in his temple, but still he was at a distance. 
to keep the people and the priests safe. But now, says our author, now there is a better hope. A better hope through Jesus, this new kind of priest. Verse 23. Now there have been many of those priests, the Levitical ones, since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men in all their weakness, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Just to be a little bit different, we're going to walk backwards through these verses. We're going to see two ways that Jesus is unlike those former priests and so offers a better hope to us. Firstly, or rather secondly in our passage, because he's not simply the one who makes the sacrifice, he is the sacrifice. He does not need to make atonement for his own sin, and so instead he offers himself in the place of sinful men and women to put them right with God. And he does so once and for all. So no longer is there the need for repeated sacrifice day after day, which only ever symbolised the people's need for forgiveness. Now forgiveness is actually achieved. Because sin is dealt with once and for all. Judgment on that sin falls on the perfect sacrifice. The one who is the substitute for guilty sinners. In his own words, it is finished. And secondly, this better hope comes because Jesus' priesthood is permanent. Because he has beaten death. Now, there have been many uh, of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to him, come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. So Jesus is able to save completely because he lives to intercede for his people before the Father. Remember again, chapter 6, verse 20, our forerunner has gone into the very presence of God himself. And because he remains sinless, he stays there. He stays there. Unlike Old Testament priests who always had to come back out again. He stays there interceding for us. Now, it's important for us to understand what we mean when we say that Jesus intercedes for us. Because we might get the impression here of Jesus pleading our case before a reluctant father. One who is permanently disappointed with us when we mess up again and again. Oh, I know, I know, Father, they've messed up again, but they're trying hard, really. And underneath, they're really, they've got good intentions. Oh, Oh, just do it for me. Accept them for me, would you? That's an entirely wrong picture of what it means for Jesus to be interceding for us. No, it's the Father who longs to be reconciled to us, who delights in us. It is the Father who sent the Son to win us for himself. It is the Father's plan to give him as a sacrifice and raise him from the dead. No, the idea rather here is of Jesus' very presence in heaven where he remains the one who has gone through death as an atoning sacrifice and risen again in triumph, his very presence there is ongoing proof of a sufficient sacrifice. His ongoing presence is proof that sin has been dealt with. It is over. So he does not plead before a reluctant father, reminding of one who has forgotten. No, he sits enthroned beside the father, Just as Psalm 110 tells us, by his mere presence, he is a celebration of the Father's plan of redemption. 
He is the guarantee of our future hope. He is the one the Father delights in because he is the one who has opened the way so that the Father might delight in us too. There is no reluctance to the Father that needs his arm twisting again and again by the Son who pleads on our behalf. Jesus' very presence as our great high priest in the very inner sanctuary of God speaks in our defence. And so he has opened the way for us into the presence of God. And we experience some of that now as the Spirit shows us the the wonder of the Father's acceptance of us and as he helps us to see and to understand and experience the depth of the Father's love for us. And one day, one day we will follow our forerunner. One day we will follow our forerunner into the throne room of God himself to delight in him forever. Do you see what you've got in Jesus? Do you see what you've got in Jesus, the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek? Do you see what you have? The perfect sacrifice, the ongoing advocate, the ever-living champion of your cause and the guarantee of your future. That's just for starters. Do you see some of the implications of this for life day by day, for what it means to know God rather than to coast with him? You can come to God yourself because this great high priest has permanently opened the way. You don't need a pastor or a vicar or a priest or a minister or whatever label you choose to place on such an individual. You get to come to him yourself whenever you want to draw near to the throne of grace. There are no barriers. You can know security. You can know security even in the aftermath of when you stuff up. Security even in the aftermath of stuffing up because Jesus is interceding for you now and always. You can know hope and a future because he has gone ahead of you as your forerunner and one day you will follow after. There is better to come better beyond what you could possibly imagine when you will see the Lord Jesus face to face and delight in him forever. Yes, there are real and significant frustrations and difficulties and pain in the here and now, but your forerunner has gone ahead to prepare a place for you. There is better to come. And you can know satisfaction because there is no greater knowledge to acquire There is no secret truth to grasp hold of. There are no hidden paths to discover that will smooth things out. You are not lagging behind anyone else half in the dark. Now all you need to do is to deepen your wonder and your joy at what Jesus has done for you. You need to see what you have in Jesus. The ultimate priest has come and he has delivered all that you need and all that you could possibly want. Do you see what you have in Jesus? Do you see what you have in Jesus, the high priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek? Let's pray together. Our gracious and eternal God, you who are king, who reigns over all of this world, We thank you that you are the one who is in charge. But we praise you too that you are so kind and gracious towards us, those who have often and willingly turned our backs on you. That you love us so much that you have put in this plan that you came up with before the very creation of the world to rescue us, to draw us back to yourself. That you always intended to send the great high priest who would be the sacrifice for us that you knew that we could never do everything ourselves, that we could never follow your law perfectly. We thank you for this great high priest promised and who has come. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving your life as that perfect sacrifice once and for all. We thank you that you rose from the dead. We thank you that you have gone before us into the very presence of the Father and that as you stand there with him, you intercede for us by your very presence, as much as by your words. 
And so we look forward to that day when we will follow you, our great forerunner. And we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Spirit to keep us in the meantime, that you will hold us and guide us and keep us all the way home. But Lord, until we get there, give us a greater and greater appreciation and delight and joy and wonder and amazement and thrill at what we have in Jesus, our High Priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song to finish, which is all about remembering our great High Priest who is ever living and pleading for us. This is our sure and certain hope. It is knowing more of this that means well, is what it is to draw closer to God and to walk with him. If you're able to stand, let's declare these wonderful truths together. Father, would you by your Spirit show us more what we have in your Son, that we might delight in that, be secure in that, and share this great and glorious good news with all those around us. In Jesus' name and for his glory we pray. Amen. Amen. Will you please take a seat. Books on the way uh, out there, over there, and some other.